There's no reason on earth why anybody on Wall Street, your insurance agent, your pension fund manager, your mutual fund guy, your employee benefit program, your IRA custodian, your Roth IRA, or any type of savings or investment for especially for anything, retirement or not, retirement pension, general savings doesn't have a position of prudence and have diversification. And the only diversification today really is not foreign currencies or small cap stocks, or it is it's precious metals, period. Stocks and bonds are heavily correlated. And whether you have stock, small caps and foreign stocks and emerging markets and S&P 500 and a tech sector, and I am so diversified. No, you're not, they're all stocks period, where you would have a true hyperinflation. Could it happen? Yes. Will it happen? I'm not sure. I don't think it will. But you don't need a hyperinflation to destroy a currency. All you need is loss of faith. That's what really happens. Some people call maple syrup liquid gold, and they think that putting it on pancakes and waffles is an idea that's pure gold. Well, in Miles Franklin, we think a pure gold idea is taking real liquid gold and turning it into real solid gold Canadian maple leaf coins. That's why right now, for a limited time, we're offering the purest gold Canadian maple leaf coins at just $105 US over spot. That's four nines of the purest gold there is in a pretty maple leaf design. And at only $105 US over spot, we'd say that's an idea that's pure gold. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest of some renowned. David Morgan is known as the Silver Guru. He's also the founder of themorganreport.com. He joins us this Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. David, thanks for coming back on. Dunnigan, it's always fun, and I'm ready for the rapid-fire round. <laughs> well, before we get to the rapid-fire questions, and we'll look forward to that from viewers who have been generous, as always, in submitting questions for you, but we wanted to touch base on, an, on a topic and a concern that's been swirling over the past month or so, and Andy Sheckman reminds me this is not a new concern. It's just the latest go-round of it. But uh, economist John Adams from Good as Gold Australia and AdamEconomics.com has been really... Uh, I guess, a, a leader of getting the word out recently about what appears to be a concern about the availability of physical silver on certain uh, unallocated accounts and ETFs and pooled accounts that may people may believe that they own silver or at least own sh partial ownership or shares in silver or something. And in fact, have when they try to convert that to physical, when they try to convert that from unallocated to allocated to get real because they're concerned about there being maybe more shares sold than there is physical available underlying, or at least just long waiting lines to get your hands. And they saw what happened last year when the COVID crash hit and everybody was scrambling to get their hands on silver and gold and found out that the lead time suddenly went from in stock to out of stock in weeks or months to get your hands on product and the premiums went sky high. So people who are trying to get their hands and know that they do have physical behind their investment, something real, that is something they can trust, are quite concerned. So uh, John has been alerting us all to the potential dangers of this situation. If people, especially large holders, might have a significant amount of these un unallocated or pooled silver accounts. Can you tell us if that's not just an Australian phenomenon, but uh, North American as well, so that those of us who want to make sure that we have the real thing uh, know what we're really dealing with. Well, there's several banks uh, or brokers or metals dealers that do unallocated accounts. In fact, I'll give you, I'll digress and tell a little story. 
back in the early days. Remember Vernon von Nothaus? He was, uh, he called himself a monetary architect. He did the uh, one, uh, one ounce silver coin and in one year it had the Fed on it and he had the dollar sign on it. And he was taken to court for uh, counterfeiting, I think was the charge. Something, what it basically was, was that there might be confusion about his silver rounds and actual treasury minted coins. Anyway, it's a long story. I won't bore you with it. But he asked me to go in and do an audit on the gold and silver that happened to be at the uh, the Sunshine Mint over in Idaho, which is pretty close to where I'm sitting now. So I said, sure, I'll do it. So I went in and had my first tour of the Sunshine Mint. And of course, there's huge, you know, commercial bars all over the place. And there was a particular pile that was kind of off to the end. And I said, you know, well, what's that? And the, the, the prime person at the Mint said, well, that's the unallocated silver. And it kind of hit me that, yeah, you know, the unallocated is a pile of silver that's in some instances, in this instance, <clears throat> uh, working, working silver. In other words, that silver was going to be melted down and extruded and uh, shaped and then cut into bars and rounds and planchettes for the U.S. Mint and everything else. So, but it kind of hit me. Yeah, it's physical. It's there, but it's, you know, it's here today, gone tomorrow. Mm. Kind of. It's a flow. It's so, and that's one example. I'm not trying to say that all unallocated accounts ends up going to mint somewhere. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that, is it there? Or isn't it there? Is to be determined. So let me come back. Yeah, there's plenty of them. I mean, full disclosure, I have a Kitco pool account. I don't have much in it. The reason I have it is because if something were to go awry, I would be on the list to be notified. That was my primary thinking when I got a pool account. So uh, there's uh, CB Mint is one. There's um, Capital Securities Bank. Uh, that's in New Zealand. There's uh, Moneyland, which is a Swiss bank. And it doesn't take a lot of research to find out that there's a lot of banks, dealers uh, around the world that offer <clears throat> unallocated. The advantage, if there is one, I don't think there is, is that you usually buy, especially in a pool accounts, very near the spot price. So there's that feature that attracts people. Also, in some cases, there's no storage, which sort of makes sense. I mean, like the example I'm giving at the Sunshine Mint from, you know, over probably 20 years ago, that silver comes and goes, you know, it's just sitting on some pallets and then it works its way through the system and then there's more delivered and it, you know, really is a flow rate really. Again, I want to be clear, that's not accounting for all unallocated silver. Unallocated silver could be sitting in a warehouse for years and uh, part of a pool system or something like that. So it doesn't necessarily mean working silver. So let's be crystal clear. Problem is you don't have title to it. We, you have, I'll call it a claim. I don't know what the legal term is, but there's no guarantee that you can go touch your property in a legal sense when it's unallocated. So it might, and you have to check the general term unallocated means that you might have to check your specific legal wording in your specific case, meaning if you're with CB Mint, as I just mentioned, or the Moneyland in Switzerland, I just mentioned to be absolutely certain. But generally speaking, you want to go to allocated. Allocated means it's allocated to you as a minimum. Really segregated is best, but allocated is the next step. So if you go from unallocated to allocated, which in almost all cases you're allowed to do, you're basically paying a fee, which is gladly paid, to secure that silver to you and as your property rather than sitting in a pool that so many people have a claim to it and you don't know who's going to, you know, vote in and have their, their claim claimed and maybe have uh, more claims on it than actually exists in the pool at, you know, any given time. So I hope I'm being clear there. I'm trying to be fair. It's uh, a way to save money, but really anyone that invests in the precious metals 
in my opinion, should want something so strong and outside the system that they can hold on to it. Now, there are reasons some people can't do that. I get it. It might be their age. It could be their apartment. It could be their travel a lot. I mean, there's reasons to have it stored or in a pool or whatever. I understand. But in most cases, you can actually take delivery. And you can have it stored in a way that uh, pretty much guarantees you have title to it. Whereas unallocated, you really don't have title to it. It reminds me, I mean, you and I have been talking together on this channel since it was Reluctant Preppers back in 2013. And in the preparedness community, people talk about having real real assets. I mean, Chris Duane always said real assets, real friends, real skills. And, and you've talked about getting real. You said get real. That was one of your mantras that when we saw yeah. you at the uh, Liberty Mastermind Symposium in Dallas. Part of that is if you, like, let's just say as a, as a preparedness-minded individual, if you think, you know, it's really important that I have a fuel to heat my home if the power went out or something like that. So that means a big, maybe a big stack of cordwood outside your back door or whatever that means. It doesn't mean you have a ticket that says on a good day you can put in for someone to put you in line to maybe possibly get you in a few weeks or a few months something that you're going to need. It's like if this is something I need for my family to protect, to be lower risk for my family, I need to know that it's mine, not that I just have a, a certificate that says I have a right to stand in line and, and wait. It just it seems, it seems to fly in the face of the idea of preparedness. That's what it comes to me. Yeah, yeah, I want to add on to that because I'm really anxious to add on. I mean, you know, again, going back to the 10 rules of silver investing, I mean, I just listened to, I think, uh, Bix Weir's take on the uh, interview done by the, uh, I guess, president or CEO of the Perth Mint. And uh, near the end of the interview, this gentleman talks about, you know, gold being kind of the safe haven and sort of sloughed off silver as having that safe haven status. That's how I heard it. You can listen and make up your own mind. But really, as I wrote in the 10 Rules of Silver Investing, rule number one is that in the event, and no one wants to be a prophet of doom, but in the event of an all-out economic collapse, silver will be the money of last resort, not gold. So this guy at the Perth Mint has it backwards in my strong, steady view. Why? Because you would do exactly what you're saying, Dunnigan. You would have dimes or quarters or halves called junk silver or constitutional silver in your hand, not waiting for that receipt to come deliver it by UPS or US mail that you could use to buy gas, buy food, trade for lumber, have somebody help you cut down a tree or anything else. Now, this is an extreme case, but that's what an extreme case is, is when you have a collapse and it doesn't have to be a collapse of everything. It could be a collapse of Let's pick one thing. Let's say food distribution for meat. Everything else comes to the grocery store, but the meat packers have gone on strike and there's no meat. Well, if you've got silver, chances are you might be able to go out if you're in such an area to a local farmer that raises beef and maybe buy some or whatever. I don't want to go on and a bunch of thought experiments, but you get my point and making your point that you've got to have it in hand. And the best thing is silver. You're not going to take gold out to buy you know, two bushes of apples, you're going to use silver. So again, I'm a little high strung on the topic because there are a few things that this gentleman said from the Perth Mint that would be a way a banker would think, you know, it wouldn't be the way a common person that works for a living, you know, would think someone that wanted to trade precious metals for some common everyday item would use silver. They wouldn't use gold. That's another uh, question that keeps coming up with people uh, talking about in the event of a, for, for a credit lockup in the banking system. We've had uh, Alistair McLeod, who's a former bank president. We've had Rob Kirby, who's a proprietary analyst that watches the international banking system quite closely and so on. They, they keep talking about these strains that are evident in the banking system. That's why that necessitated the Fed to start nightly repo actions. You've talked to us about that. You said, oh, yeah. I remember your, your quote, you said, the banks don't trust each other overnight, overnight. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so in such an environment where there are clearly uh, credit and liquidity strains already present since September of 2019, so we're a year and a half almost into that, um, it seems uh, quite 
startling that people uh, are starting to wake up to that and, and they're starting to say, well, in the event of a credit freeze or credit lockup or a bank holiday or something like that, what would I be able to turn to? And so that is a question that's on people's mind is, is gold or silver going to play a preeminent role in terms of protecting their savings or protecting their ability to transact? And your point, I think, is that from an everyday transaction standpoint, just to meet the needs, the daily, weekly needs of your family for food, for transportation, for repairs, for that kind of uh, everyday items, uh, silver is likely to serve that utility as, as a premier um, go-to for many people in, in an emergency plan B. Correct, but I think it bears uh, a bit of discussion that anywhere in the world, including the United States, particularly outside of the U.S. border, it's the U.S. dollar. So, I mean, if you were in Venezuela or more, you know, Argentina or any of the places that are having a currency crisis as we speak, what you would be doing is going to the quote unquote black market and taking your pesos or whatever currency is being hyperinflated away. And probably the most sought after would be U.S. dollars. And that will be true in a liquidity squeeze here at some point that the dollar will actually do well. But that's sort of a precursor to what will happen in the, in the metals themselves because the ultimate is the precious metals. But until we get there, the next most liquid thing is physical pieces of paper that are green with president's pictures on them. And again, especially outside the United States. So people get this idea that, you know, the dollar is going to go away or whatever. It's, <laughs> it hasn't yet. It well, probably, the Fed has been doing a pretty good disappearing act if it's lost 98% of its value since 1913. I don't know if it's hard to understand or not. I mean, we're talking about the last two cents of value that's in the dollar. Yeah. Is that going to absolute zero or not? It's kind of a moot point. But right now, it's still coveted because it's the best thing out there that's a piece of paper. Doesn't mean it's really worth that much. It's just the best of all the rest. But the point is that even at some place, on that path to total towards zero, they'll either reset, which is what they're really pushing for. We, they, who's a, the elite bankers, basically what you hear out of the World Economic Forum, which is really a front. I mean, it exists and you see all these high powered people, but those aren't the real power people. As powerful as those billionaires are with all their cars and all their jets and all their, you know, holdings and all their Bitcoin and everything else. And yeah, they're way up there in a financial sense. But they're not as powerful. They're powerful. But the most, most of them get their orders from people you never hear their names. So anyway, back on point. Don't be surprised to see the dollar be more valuable versus other currencies. And still gold going up along with it. It's going down right now. The dollar's strong. Well, that ebbs and flows. But at the end of the end, which we're very close to, the metals were real prevail and the dollar will maybe go up with it for a while but there'll be a move out of the dollar as it's getting reset not trusted or there's more likely a disruption in the debt markets or the bond market once the benchmark 10 year goes above two percent the fed will probably mandate that the yield will have to stay there they'll try to yield control the the yield curve believing they're all powerful and they're not. The market's more powerful than they are. The dealers are stuck with a bunch of paper, treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds that they are holding at a loss. So they will want to sell them before they lose even more money on them. So that selling begets selling. And so there's a lot in store that in theory, the treasuries pretty much spent its last bunch of borrowed money from the Fed by July. So they'll have to go back to the private banking corporation, the Federal Reserve, and on behalf of the United States citizenry say, hey, we got to borrow a few more, you know, you know, billions. <laughs> you may as well just say trillions at this point. And, uh, <clears throat> you, know, you know, we're good for it. We'll pay it back. Of course, it can never be paid back. So what if the Fed says, no, you've borrowed enough. We don't trust you to pay it back. I'm making a joke and I'm not. I'm trying to really get people to think about this cannot go on forever. As Chris Dwayne often says, things that can't go on forever don't. 
this can't and it won't. Will it end in July? No. Something's happening like the repo market, you know, is really probably still in dire straits. We don't hear about it because of the illness. All we hear about is the illness. But the illness, in my view, is it's there. I don't want to belittle it, but I don't want to overemphasize it like it's been. It's, in my view, mostly a cover for what's going on in the financial system. A related question for people who are trying to get out of unreal uh, assets and get into real assets. Uh, they're wondering, should they should they sell SLV and buy silver? What do they do? This is a question from Boomer Sooner Fan 03 who says, is it best to buy physical or a PSLV to help the short squeeze? I only own physical for the record, he says. <laughs> well, I'd say, you know, it's always best to take care of yourself. I know that sounds selfish, but, you know, if you don't make it or your family doesn't make it, then who does? I mean, you've got to make it you know, to the lifeboat first and then maybe help that other person or persons on board, right? So in a way, you, you have to be a bit selfish in my view before you can really give out that helping hand. So I would say if you have the wherewithal to secure what you need physically and then have something beyond that, the PSLV puts a lot more pressure on the silver market, which is the commercial bar market, than the SLV does. Question about forms of silver to acquire. Uh, Judah Lamontan says, Mr. Morgan, in your view, is it a good idea or not to acquire grams or kilograms of silver bullion as opposed to bullion denominated in ounces? To make any difference? I'm not sure if he's keying in on the this, this size and the scale or if he's talking about metric versus the troy ounces system. Make any difference from your standpoint? No, I think in the 10 rules of silver, uh, you know, I've said something to the effect that silver is silver is silver. I mean, what a lot of people don't know when they're new or rookies is that at the sell side, the premiums go away. So a silver eagle sells for the same as a silver round on the sell back. Now, is that exactly true? No. In some cases, especially right now, you'll get a pretty good premium for mm -hmm. selling back a silver eagle. Yep. But most of the time, the, the premiums narrow, so you won't get a, as huge a premium on a government minted coin that uh, you might expect to get for, versus a silver round. So in other words, an ounce of silver is an ounce of silver, regardless of who stamped it, government or private. So I wouldn't worry about grams or ounces, just accumulate the silver, accumulate what you like. I mean, the only thing that I kind of guard against is buying semi-rare coins, they're usually a ripoff, not always. I'm generally speaking here, I don't want people upset with me. Also, any rare coins is fine if you collect art or know the industry, but it's a specialty market I don't know that much about other than you got to be very careful. So you're very much best off buying the most silver you can per dollar invested, which means you know, a kilo bar might be better than buying a one ounce round as far as cost per ounce. But then there's a disadvantage that you have to make a choice with 32 ounces versus one ounce. So there's an advantage to having smaller units. If you're a big investor, then it doesn't make that much difference. You're going to see, you know, if you're going to buy hundreds of kilos, then that's probably a way to go because you're paying a lot, you know, much less premium. So it depends on a case by case basis. To start with, you're best buying. Usually junk silver, really, if you can get it and um, buy a small amount, see how the dealer treats you, see how it's packaged, see how long the delivery takes, all that stuff. And when you're satisfied, then you can put in more money or buy over time. This next question is a little bit long, but I think it, it kind of walks us down through a path that's intriguing. I'd like to get your take on it. Dear Fly Guy says, Everybody knows that precious metal markets are manipulated. Okay, well, we'll just take that as his supposition to start this. When the manipulators are caught, they're fined massive amounts of currency rather than anyone going to jail for manipulation. Then they do it all over again because the rewards they gain from manipulation far outweigh the fines they're assessed regardless of how large those fines seem to be. What I'd like to know is just who gets those fines, maybe likely some branch or branches of the government. Furthermore, these manipulations seem designed to hold down the values of precious metals, which results in strengthening the value of the dollar. So the biggest winners in this scam are the people who are the manipulators and the government. 
The only losers are the rest of us, precious metals holders who lose money due to the manipulation and never see a cent of any fines that were levied. It seems to me there's no incentive for the government to desire an end to the manipulations, nor for the manipulators to ever stop manipulating. It's a cash cow for both those parties who appear to be co-conspirators in the scam. Do I have this right? What am I missing here? What say you? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Of course, you'll be called a conspiracy theorist and you'll be called, uh, you know, whatever the fancy, you know, nomenclature is at any given point in time. I think they're called keyboard warriors now. If you have the audacity to buy silver over the Internet, you're a keyboard warrior because you want something of, you know, intrinsic beauty that has monetary value and has for thousands of years. I mean... You know, the other side is very good at, uh, let's say, using words and music, smoke and mirrors to make the other side look bad to the general public that's undereducated on the topic. But no, that's basically it. And I'll just add, so everyone says, well, then why bother is because all manipulations. And in fact, I think what's happening, and going back to the original point, I think I want to stress a little bit more is if you have a pool account or if you have an unallocated account, it really behooves you to move from that status into allocated or better yet, take physical delivery. So there's a couple ways you can do it. One, you can do it in-house in most cases, which means you can go to XYZ Bank or XYZ Mint or XYZ dealer and say, I want to move my unallocated to allocated. You can do that with a phone call. Now, they may give you, you know, a hard time on the phone. They may not. If they really give you a rough time, then I would suggest that you cash out and take that cash and go to someone that has silver, which a lot of people are saying how tight it is. But I know lots of dealers that still have silver for sale. They just have high premiums on it. You take that unallocated cash check. You just got deposit it and then go buy physical and take delivery. So you can do it in-house or you can just cash out and reinvest in, in physical metal. And I think if enough people did that, that we would definitely start to see um, who's real and who isn't. You know, we talked about be real, buy real, get real. You know, get real metal. Don't get allocated metal or pool metal. Again, I don't want to be fair. There are people that probably just don't have the means to, uh, you know, get a hold of it and hold it or they're scared to or whatever. But those are the vast minority. I mean, most people can take the real physical metal and uh, be much better off because they have it. This is an interesting question uh, because it involves the dynamics of this grassroots effort that's going on to try to bring, I guess when you say get real, a lot of people, and I've had clients call me and ask me, they want to get their 10 ounces or their 20 ounces just because it's for the cause. And I said, well, what's the cause in, in your way of understanding? Yeah. I said, we want to make, we want to make, uh, first of all, we want something that is real. We want something that's truthful that we can, we can really trust and it's not being taken away from us by inflation, that kind of thing, like our savings accounts are. But we also want to shine the light on what's really going on with the potential manipulation of, of the metal market. So Theodore Lee says, I hear that once institutional investors get involved in the precious metals sector, that it will price out small retail investors. But what about large retail investors? Where are they in this market? Are they making a difference right now? And how important are they in helping the small retail investors in getting the ball rolling with regards to bringing in the really big players? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I followed it. I'll give it a stab and you can give me feedback. I mean, first of all, let's go back. I've talked about this, I think, last time that we were together. But if you go back to 2020, uh, Davos or World Economic Forum, Scott Meaner, Chief Investment Officer of Guggenheim, said silver is his conviction trade. And 300 million ounces was bought in the uh, ETPs, Exchange Traded Products, last year. Record high. Nothing close to 300 million ounces. Actually, it's more than that ever bought in one year before. So that's institutional investing. Now, big retail, how do you define that? I don't know. But obviously, the more silver purchased and held for investment by strong hands, the better off the market is. But it's always at the margin. So, you know, if you got two whale, one whale, 
and 10 big retail investors, and there's still enough, let's say, cover ratio where there isn't enough demand physically to actually put hurt on the market, then even the little guys uh, together could cause enough disruption. You know, I mean, as I said in that Miss in the Silver Market, one of my pet peeves, you know, and look it up. I think it's called Miss in the Silver Market, I believe. It's on my YouTube channel. You know, any dealer, especially in the 70s, would tell you everyone should own a little metal. In other words, it's a good way to hedge the currency problems ahead. Own some gold, own some silver. Everybody should own a little. So in that video I made, I said, well, how much is a little? And I said, it's arbitrary, but let's call two silver ounces a little. And how much is every? How much is everybody? And I said, well, let's just say everybody in the United States, which is only 5% of the world's population. So at that time when I made the video, if every American owned two ounces of silver, you'd wipe out the annual mine supply year over year over year. And I said, well, two ounces is, is certainly a little. And 5% of the world's population is a little. So if they mean everyone, everyone on the planet owned a little, you get my point. Not everyone can own a little silver. So getting to, and I've said all that to say this, that means that the power of the little guy buying a little silver could be a lot more powerful than some, you know, huge retail investor playing into there. Silver doesn't really care what the demand is by, you know, nationality or, uh, investor size or location or any of that stuff. All it knows is there's a demand for it. If it's, you know, one ounce from a thousand people or a thousand ounces from one person it really doesn't matter. You're talking about using metals as a hedge like for anyone. Uh, this is a question from rookie. It, it has to do with that as that aspect of hedging. Why would any investment fund buy out gold and silver when also consequently risking their other investments? Well, I'm not sure I understand exactly, but let me stab at it. I mean, basically a hedge means it's like an insurance policy. So let's take 1980 as an example. Gold in the uh, 1980s went from roughly 100 to 850. So I'm going to make it round numbers so we can do the math in our heads really easy. So I'm going to say it went from 100 to 1,000. It didn't quite, but it was a 10-bagger. That would be a 10-bagger. Now, a 10% position in gold that went up tenfold would make you whole if everything else in your uh, investment basket went to zero. So let's go through it a little more specifically. Your total worth is $1,000. That's counting your stocks. And I know it's a small number, but I'm just doing the math in our head so everyone can follow me. So your total worth with your financial assets is $1,000. It's stocks and bonds and maybe a limited partnership or whatever. And that makes up $900. And your hedge is 10% of that, which is $100, which is in gold. Now, a few years later, everything goes to hell like it did in 1979, early 1980. And you look at your portfolio and your stocks are down, your bonds are down, your limited partnership is down, but gold has gone on 10, from 100 to 1,000. So if you look at your portfolio, that little bit of insurance has covered everything that you have. And you're still ahead. Why? Because gold made up for everything that was going down. And everything that went down went down. Let's say your stocks were down 60% and your bonds were down 70%. They're still worth something. And your limited partnership was only off 30%. So if you add those values that are down significantly from when you bought them, gold has more than made up for your total portfolio loss. That's why you always absolutely must have a hedge position if you know what you're doing. And I want to go a step further. There's been a couple studies on this. One was the Ibbotson study, and that showed about a 15% weighting. And CPM, Jeffrey Christian, did one, and he looked at uh, 1968 onward, and he found out to have the best portfolio balance for a scenario like I just outlined, you needed a 25% weighting in the gold market. 
market, physical gold, not you know an ETF or an unallocated account. So that's why it's just portfolio knowledge. It's how investments works. It's actually the prudent man theory. And what I've always worried about on your certified financial planners and your wealth managers and your insurance companies and your pension funds and all this big money that's out there is almost for practical purposes, none of them have done what I outlined. And all of them could be in a very big lawsuit at some point because they didn't do it. So it's a very good question. And I certainly hope people take it to heart and think about what I've just said and verify it for themselves and spread the word because there's no reason on earth why anybody on Wall Street, your insurance agent, your pension fund manager, your mutual fund guy, your employee benefit program, your IRA custodian, your Roth IRA, or any type of savings or investment for especially for anything, retirement or not, retirement, pension, general savings doesn't have a position of prudence and have diversification. And the only diversification today really is not foreign currencies or small cap stocks, or it is it's precious metals, period. Stocks and bonds are heavily correlated. And whether you have stock, small caps and foreign stocks and emerging markets and S&P 500 and a tech sector. And I am so diversified. No, you're not. They're all stocks, period. Yeah, I'm gravely concerned about that very topic because, again, I started this channel back in end of 2013 to try to reach as many people as I could to help them find ways that they could on their own and collaborating together take care of reducing risk for their families and now exactly what you're saying so many people have whether it's uh, pensions or uh, retirement plans or whatever you know they've been pay paying into some of them their whole career whether you know the ohio firefighters fund just put five percent into into gold uh, last year but i've been thinking about so many others you think about hundreds of thousands millions of people whose entire financial futures are basically exposed and unprotected uh, from risk. And they think that that's going to, uh, even if they think, well, I'm not sure Social Security is going to be there, but at least I've got my pension, or at least I've got my retirement. And it's like, man, we've seen uh, certain, you know, either what is Chicago, uh, some of these state pensions, uh, teachers unions, things like that, that are getting into trouble because they were planning on making 7% year over year on treasury bonds, and they're not making that anymore. So they're having to go gamble with riskier uh, you know, had positions in the stock market or whatever. And you're right, Ibbotson says metals are the only thing that's negatively correlated to stocks and bonds anymore. So just really concerned about just the people, you know, oh, the humanity is is when when stuff hits the fan, how many people are going to be hurt? How bad just because they didn't force the issue with who was taking care of their their um, funds, their retirement, or take control of it themselves. But that's a uh, you 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 enunciated that uh, very clearly, and I hope that, that people go back and listen to that part again. Um, so that's the uh, the question. Then at the at the national level, the sovereign level, what are we seeing over the past several years of different countries, either taking or not taking uh, prudent steps? Uh, question from QR says: If the U.S. is on the road to ruin, printing itself into oblivion. Why wouldn't it use a portion of the printed fiat to buy gold in preparation for the coming reset of the global financial system? Supposedly, Fort Knox gold holdings notwithstanding. So we've heard about Germany asking for their gold back. We've heard about Poland asking for their gold back, and a bunch of other countries trying to repatriate their their gold out of the out of the London uh, vaults or different places. Um, what's your view of? Is this or is this not happening at the sovereign, at the country level, as well as the individual household that we've been focusing on? Yeah, another one that's sort of tough to answer. Uh, so what you would get from the establishment or any banker would be, well, we own, you know, 265 million ounces. Just look at the annual report that comes out to the Treasury every year. There's a line item that says gold and it says it's got, you know, two, 265 million ounces, round numbers. So they'll claim that that Fort Knox gold is on the books. Yeah, it's on the books and uh, that it's there. And I would question whether or not it's there or even if it is there, who really owns it? 
But if they went and said, no, we're buying you know, more gold or extra gold because, uh, you know, we're printing ourselves into oblivion, <laughs> then uh, that would uh, be devastating to them. They have to posture. They have to maintain this smiley face. We know better than you do. We are bankers. We know everything. You don't be quiet and listen. We'll tell you, you know, what's going on in the economy. So they have to put up that front, whether they know they're doing it or not. As far as looking beyond the U.S., then there's a whole different story. You see what's happened with China, and I have a cartoon I put up on my Twitter feed every now and then. It shows this. It's like a volleyball game with a net between China on one side and some of the Western uh, nations on the other side, and we're throwing them gold bricks, and they're throwing our paper money back to us over the net pretty good uh, metaphor for what's really going on. China and Russia both have been accumulating massive amounts of gold for their, you know, for the rainy day savings, for their banking system, for a potential maybe uh, reinstitution of gold in the monetary system. But it is the money of last resort. They know it. We know it. But most people don't even think about it. So, it depends. Looking at the U.S., I think I answered it. Looking at foreign nations, they view it differently and act differently than we do. But then you look at the Western nations. I mean, England sold out all of their gold at rock bottom prices. Canada sold all their gold or very close to it. I don't know the status of Australia, but the Her Majesty's Kingdom, you know, the Great Britain and Canada, <clears throat> they're gone. They've sold their gold. So it's... Uh, you know, it's gone as it has in the past. I'll just elaborate slightly more, but you can actually tra uh, trace the ups and downs in the uh, global empire by watching what the gold trade did. If you look at um, the earlier times prior to the United States being the preeminent nation state for productivity, you England had the biggest power as what's uh, as an Austrian economist, you'd call uh, productivity of the power to produce goods and services. And they also had the most gold. And then when it shifted from the UK to the United States, the United States became the ma main source of productivity and also acquired the most gold. Now you're seeing the productivity move to China. And guess what? They're also acquiring the most gold. So it's an interesting uh, study if you look at it and see, you know, the old adage, follow the money. Well, if everything, if J.P. Morgan is right and gold is money and everything else is credit, all you have to do is look what the gold flows are and you've got a pretty good idea of what's really going on. Uh, one more question from uh, Fat Vegan who says, how could anyone truly know whether the U.S. dollar would or would not go into a Weimar Germany hyperinflation? What would be the things you would have to see to believe that a Weimar Germany hyperinflation-like incident could happen to the U.S. dollar? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a bit of a test, but <clears throat> I don't think we'll ever go into hyperinflation, and here's why. The U.S. capital markets, the debt markets, are the biggest market in the world by far, and up until this point, basically the most stable. So the bond market, whether it's short-term treasury bills or two-year notes or five-year notes or the benchmark 10 year or the long bond, whatever it is across the spectrum of different uh, time factors, that market is a stabilizing influence to inflation and deflation. So if we start getting rapid inflation, the yields are pushed up, which makes bond prices go down, which is deflationary. So I don't see an advanced capital markets like the United States is, which is basically the global market because the dollar still uh, the reserve currency of the world and about 60% of all the financial transactions that with that governing factor yields up prices down where you would have a true hyperinflation. Could it happen? Yes. Will it happen? I'm not sure. I don't think it will. But you don't need a hyperinflation to destroy a currency. All you need is loss of faith. That's what really happens. I mean, let's say my example of, you know, everyone should own a little silver actually manifest. 
you know, and everybody in the world, well, okay, everybody in the world wanted silver. And so that's 10% actually decided they really were going to do something about it. So you're looking at, you know, 700 million people, maybe a billion people that want one ounce of silver. Well, that's a billion ounces right there. That's the total mine capacity of the whole world for one year and all the recycling. So it's a very small market. That's another pet peeve of mine is some of these official dumb establishment types talking about how vast the silver market is. Well, they're being very loose with their wording because if they're being honest, the vastness of the silver market is the vastness of the silver derivatives market. It's infinite. They can create as much paper derivatives as they want. They can make a trillion, trillion, trillion ounces of silver on paper. But the actual silver market, the commercial bar market, the thousand ounce bars, there's what um, in the ETFs, there's a billion ounces, two billion ounces. So, um, you know, there's just several million uh, thousand ounce bars. It's a very small market. Silver, physical. Silver derivatives market, well, it's huge. It's all beyond belief. These bankers can create it forever. But it won't because there's a mismatch. There's a mismatch between the amount of printed Federal Reserve notes and the actual amount of goods and services that are actually out in the physical economy. And there's a difference between the amount of derivative silver products that can be produced and the amount of actual silver that exists. And the amount of silver that exists is, you know, 100 times smaller rule of thumb you know, Jeffrey Christian back at the CFTC hearing or some others, general rule of thumb is 100 to 1. It could be more, it could be less. But uh, so, you know, you have 100 times something, that means only 1% of that whole market is physical and the other 99% is wishful thinking. So, of course, it's vastly huge. It's 100 times bigger, minimum maybe, I won't say a minimum, 100 times bigger rule of thumb than uh, what uh, the real market is. So when these establishment types tell you about how vast the silver market is, they're not telling you the physical silver market. They use the word silver very loosely, the same way that the SLV uses the word silver or the SIVR uses the word silver. Because, you know, if you're buying an SIVR, SLV or an SIVR, um, investment or call it an investment you're buying a share of stock and last time i looked a share of stock isn't a piece of silver i think that's a truism <laughs> as long as we <laughs> we got one last question this is a short one david morgan are you related to jp not at all <laughs> no no not even close that was from pharaoh phoenix well if people do want to find out what you're really all about, David, where should they get plugged in? Go to themorganreport.com, get on our opt-in list. Uh, look at the blog two or three times a week, but being on our, our free email list is the best way to go. Morgan Report, themorganreport.com. If you want the book, go to the uh, website and pull down the books tab and buy it right off the website. If you buy it on Amazon, you're gonna pay double or triple what I'll sell it to you for off of the website. All right, and folks, if you don't want to lose track with us and you want to make sure you don't miss any of David's interviews or any of our other guests' interviews and all the links and descriptions for all of those uh, interviews, make sure you go to libertyandfinance.com over in the left-hand margin, put your name and your email address, and opt in to our free, all free, newsletter that comes out three times a week that gives you all of the links to all of our guests. David Morgan, silver guru and founder of themorganreport.com, thanks for joining us here again on Liberty and Finance. Thank you, Don. I good. appreciate it. Some people call maple syrup liquid gold. And they think that putting it on pancakes and waffles is an idea that's pure gold. Well, in Miles Franklin, we think a pure gold idea is taking real liquid gold and turning it into real solid gold Canadian maple leaf coins. That's why right now, for a limited time, we're offering the purest gold Canadian maple leaf coins at just $105 US over spot. That's four nines of the purest gold there is in a pretty maple leaf design. And at only $105 US over spot, 
We'd say that's an idea that's pure gold. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com.